Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today we are celebrating the GA, the general availability of Delta Live Tables. The Delta Live Tables, or DLT, as I'll be calling it constantly throughout this video, um, is this whole ETL management framework built into Databricks that is now available in everyone else's workspace. It's been in public preview or a gated public preview for quite some time now. So we've been able to make videos and talk about it and show off what it can do, but not everyone's had their hands on it. Not even been able to just go and have a quick play and see if it's for you. That's no longer the case. You can now open up your Databricks workspace and go and have a play with DLT and see what it actually does for you. So what I thought today, given in celebration of this thing going live, we'll do a quick little look at what it looks like now that it's gone GA. There's a few little UI changes, a few little things that come in. Things like pricing, we can now get an idea of what the pricing structure is inside DLT. Plus, I'll do a quick recap overview. So if you've not been following the progress of it, if you're sitting there going, I've heard of Delta Table, but I've no idea what a Delta Live Table is, we will have a quick recap and bring you up to speed in terms of what this new thing that you can find inside your Databricks workspace actually is. So, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And let me know in the comments if you're currently using DLT, if you've been following it through the gate of public preview and you're using it in anger and getting a load of value from it, what kind of use cases are you using it for? Who's using it for? What kind of data personas are you finding actually get the most benefit from it? We're really, really interested to hear people's use cases and what you're actually doing. Until then, let's have a bit of a look. So we had the update announcement blog. So it's gone GA, it's formally announced. Um, blog's kind of interesting in that you can go and see a load of customer use cases. Who's actually using it? What are they using it for? Um, and you can get straight from the horse's mouth how Databricks actually see Dell's live tables helping. What's it for? So accelerating ETL. So if you have nothing, if you don't already have an ETL framework, you don't already have a load of things built to accelerate your dev, you can pick up DLT, throw some SQL at it, and it will build out the skeleton of that data processing framework for you. It'll manage dependencies, it'll manage daily refresh and the scheduling of things, the optimizing and managing of those tables. It'll do an element of that for you. Management of infrastructure. So because it's built using job clusters, using job clusters to process a load of tables, working out when it needs to be turned on, turning it on, turning it off, managing that for you is all done. Makes it nice and easy. Data confidence. So there's a whole data quality expectations built into it, which produces a load of stats and audit trail logs and observability. So if you're managing data quality inside your data pipelines, that's built in, which is really cool. And then simplified batch and streaming. So we can do have a single set of code and go, well, that bit's stream, and that bit's batch, and that bit's stream, and that bit's batch, and actually just join the two together, which we can do because of Delta. But it takes a bit of engineering to know how it all works. And this is just abstracting it away, simplifying this to make it easy for everyone. That's how they're seeing Delta Live Tables helping. And there's an overview video coming from Databricks themselves walking through a load of these changes. Okay. So, go look at the blog. I'll put a link down in the description and you can go and have a play. Until then, what you should now see, if you are in the data science and engineering persona, so if you've got your switcher and you're on the classic Databricks uh, workspace, down in jobs. I don't quite know why it's hidden away in jobs. It feels a bit kind of like round the back corner kind of thing, but we can look inside jobs and you should now see this tab called Delta Live Tables. So previously, if you weren't on the gated public preview, you would have seen demo videos, people talking about it, people showing this off, but you wouldn't have had that tab yourself. Now, every Databricks workspace, I believe, I don't know if there's certain regions, not in, certainly in AWS and Azure, you should have that Delta Live Tables tab and you can get started and start having a play with this stuff. So this is where we manage things and we create a list of these pipelines. Now for the pipelines to work, we just point them at notebooks. We need to say, here's a notebook that's got the logic that I want you to turn into a data processing pipeline. So actually the first step is writing a notebook. Now I've just got a real simple example. I've grabbed the same one I've shown in previous demos this is from the Databricks website. If you go to the docs, they've got a few sample notebooks and you can get things like this. So this is a very SQL flavored version of it. So it's written entirely in SQL and I'm saying, well, there's a, a live table. I've got that new live keyword in there. I'm giving it a, a name. I can do comments. I can do various other bits. And I'm saying, go and select from a certain location. In this case, it's loading some JSON data. I've then got a second table. 
And again, going through the live uh, keyword again. This time, it's based on that previous table. So I'm creating a table, and I'm immediately writing another query that uses that table. And then I've got another query that uses that earlier table. So we have an idea of dependencies built in just because I'm happened to be referring to the other Hive table names inside my query. The other piece is I've got these constraints. So this is saying, I want you to measure the data quality for me. I want you to count how many uh, particular records have a null title. I want you to count, actually, we should have a, a, a set of valid kind of, you know, click count should be greater than zero. And if it fails, I want you to break the whole pipeline. We can build in these gateways, these you're allowed to succeed as long as these metrics is. And I don't want you to break, but can you keep track of how many records fail this? We can have these kind of data quality expectations built in into our SQL. So we build up that kind of that list of stuff. And then what we can do is we can create a pipeline. And that gives us a whole little dialogue of how to go and do it. And we'll talk about these things in a second. I've got core, pro, and advanced. So I've now got different flavors of Delta Live tables depending on which features I want enabled. And that is new. I hadn't seen that before until today. We can go and have a look and choose the flavor of DLT that we actually need. I can give it a name. This is my DLT with SQL. And then I choose my notebook libraries. Now, I got really confused when it was called notebook libraries. All that means is which notebooks do you want to be pointing to? So in this case, I'm going to dive into DLT. I'm going to point into those examples and point at that DLT with SQL notebook. And then all that's going to do is when this kicks off, it's going to scan this code. It's going to read that code and go, right, you've got three tables. Oh, and that one depends on that one, which depends on that one. Cool. I'm going to take that and turn that into my Delta Live Table pipeline. And you can have multiple notebook libraries that can point to over several different ones. And it'll just work out all the different tables, all the different dependencies across all the objects created in those um, libraries, and then turn it into a giant processing graph. So really cool in that we can just keep adding them in. Just when you see libraries, don't think Python libraries. Don't think I need to go to pip install and bring some things down and that's what I want to do. Or you have to build a Python wheel that contains all this stuff. None of that is relevant. All this is saying is which of the notebooks deployed into my Databricks workspace has the logic for the tables I'm trying to create. So we can do that. We can add uh, configurations. Now that could be around cluster definitions, lots of different settings we can go and have a play with. And this basically builds it up for us out of key value pairs. We give it a target. So this is me essentially sort of creating a Hive database. If I call it DLT with SQL, when this ran, it would create a Hive database called DLT with SQL. And then those three tables that I've got defined in here, my Clickstream, Top Spark Refers, those three tables will be inside that DLT with SQL database. Storage location, where should it go? And I can give it a place in my lake. I can give it a place in DBFS. You should never give it a place in DBFS. But I can give it a place in ADOS Gen 2 if my is your, and then just deploy. That's where those Delta tables are going to live. It's also where a load of metadata and all the observability and the logs and all that kind of good stuff also lives next to the data in the lake in that storage location. Out, lake, whatever. I can choose. Is this a permanently streaming job? This turns on and it's just then constantly running if I'm trying to stream everything in. And I can use things like autoloaders to do file streaming. Just have it as a continuous stream. Or I can say triggered. And then this is just sitting there waiting for me to schedule it and say, this is when I want you to run. Uh, I can choose the cluster sizing. I just want one worker, be tiny. I can choose Photon. If I'm doing the kind of aggregation, the calculations that Photon's really good for. Loads of settings and things. So we go through that. Now this thing. Core process, uh, core, pro, and advanced are my three different flavors of Delta Live tables depending on what I'm using inside it. That's this helpful help me choose, which gives us this new pricing box that I hadn't seen before. This is essentially saying, well, how much of the fancy stuff do you really want inside Delta Live tables? So you've got your basic, your core, and that's essentially saying you can write in Python or SQL, great. I can insert into a table, or I can trash and replace that table each time. Essentially the append or overwrite modes for writing out a data frame. And I want DLT to be able to auto scale the cluster under the hood. So your basic mode. Pro and change data capture. Now I did a video on change data capture uh, a couple of weeks back, and that's not change data capture, that is merge. That's applied changes. 
I want you to take an incoming data set and I want you to merge it into this existing delta live table using these keys. When it when it's an uh, when it's an insert, do this. When it's an update, do this. When it's a delete, do this. It's a classic merge statement built into our delta live table pipeline. So if you want that functionality, you have to be pro. If you want data quality management, you have to be advanced. Now for me, what like expectations and all of the data quality measurement observability stuff is one of the key selling features of Delta Live Tables. So I'd be surprised if there's many people who aren't going advanced and using a lot of the uh, expectation stuff. So it's, I don't know if it's that much of a choice, honestly. If you've got some very simple workflows, absolutely just go with Core and it'll be a little bit cheaper. Um, but yeah, you now have this sliding scale Whereas I think most people who are using this are going to be using expectations. So they're going to be in this advanced mode. So you do all that and that will create your Delta Live Table area. Now I'm actually going to skip to one that we created before uh, rather than you guys watch me wait for a cluster to start up. And in this case, I want to quickly show some of the other flavors that we've seen just to give you the kind of things that we can do. So we've seen DLT with SQL. I can just define some things as SQL statements and it'll work out the dependencies and how they fit together. Uh, we can do other things. So I've got a goal table here. So that is just written in Python. So this is using the PySpark version of it. So DLT, the table name is this. I'm adding in an expectation by passing in a separate config file. So I'm doing two different constraints here. The color's not null and it needs to have products. Very similar to what we saw in the SQL version. This is me being a little bit more Pythonic defining it as some config, passing it in as something that can be listed out. And then just using some SQL inside my PySpark. So I'm kind of mixing and matching. Here's my SQL query definition, which I could be passing in as a string from somewhere. And this is what I want you to go and do to create that goal table. So we can have nice Python SQL blends. We can insert our business logic. We can make things a little easier for people. Uh, one of the videos I did was around taking taking this whole thing and applying frameworking to our framework and saying, well, actually DLT is great for visualizing this stuff, but I want to drive it with metadata. I want to have a rules. I want to pass it a list of tables and have it automatically spin up the things it needs for all those tables. So I ran through this as a bit of code in here. Essentially, I've created this kind of real basic load a table into silver. Essentially, grab a table from source, land it into a, the first bronze area, pick it up again, apply some data quality, apply some cleaning, land it again into this silver table. And then we can do this kind of thing. We can say, well, actually, I've got a list of things. I want you to get this list of tables and run this function for each thing in that list of tables. And DLT will understand that each one of those is a separate table definition and build out our dependency graph accordingly. So it's pretty cool. We can actually extend it and build around it and do some nice things inside it. And then finally, I took that same uh, example and that's not the right one. Let's see, DLT emerging. So taking that same kind of idea, except this time saying, I want to do this, apply changes. So instead of just doing that straight, insert my data into that table, off you go. We can say, get my target table ready, apply changes. This, these are the keys I'm trying to join by. This is what I want to order by in terms of doing my merge precedence, all of that kind of stuff. And again, there's another video going into the details, just so you have a flavor of that's the kind of thing you can do. So taking this, uh, the one that I've ran already, it ran this frameworked version. That's just taking a list of tables and doing that kind of bronze, silver hop for each of those tables. And then this gold table, which is taking the results of that. It's relying on those silver tables to create an aggregated table. And if I create a Delta live table pipeline on top of that, I get something that looks a little bit like this. Ooh, that's very zoomed in. So we can see a few different things here. The so one, it's built out this dependency map. So it's worked out that I had a load of bronze, essentially stepping stone views in there. And I can go and have a look and can see the schema. I can see some details of what that looks like. Each of my tables has been created as a different object in here, despite the fact that my actual code was just a generic function that I ran in a loop and I just, it was all derived at runtime. It's still, when it processed it, worked out each of those different objects. I've got the schema information. I've got some stats around it. I have this whole event log down below telling me what's happened at each stage. So it's finished writing that table, it's done that table, it's done that table. I can go and dig into the details and see what's actually happening down there. And then that final table, again, I've got my kind of nice little final thing, but I defined some data quality. So inside that gold, I'd had that, if you remember that little expectations list, those two different metrics I wanted 
DLT to track for me. And I can go in there and I can see the results for my data quality expectations. So has color allow. I can see all my this list. Has color has products. Nothing failed. My has products, which is good. But one record failed. My has color. Okay, I can go and track that. I can keep an eye on it. And as this goes over time, this running daily, running hourly, however I want to schedule it, I can be keeping track of those metrics and then actually understanding how my data quality is trending over time. <sighs> Loads of stuff in there. That's like four videos worth of demos just quickly brushed over. I get there's a lot of stuff in there. The main thing is because it is code first, you still write a notebook, you still define it really nice and simply in SQL or with a bit of PySpark frameworkery. You can actually do quite a lot of sophisticated stuff and then still poke it into Delta Live Tables and then take that work out the dependencies, manage it all for you, run it all for you. Uh, we can go and have a play and do some extra thing and we can tell it to just kick off and start. We can say, I want you to run on the schedule. And then this will automatically create a job for us that kicks it off. So I can say, well, actually, I want you to run every hour. I want you to run a 10 past the hour, run this data quality pipe, like this whole end to end DLT pipeline. Lots of stuff we can do. And alerting and other kind of job style things we can get on top of it. We've got the new permissions model. That is fairly new that's come in. And we can say, well, well, I'm the owner. Oh, no, only me can actually work with it. But someone else, Terry, he's allowed to view it. He can't run it. He can't kick it off. He can't delete it. But he can go and have a look at the results and he can see the data quality metrics over time. Or maybe he's allowed to run it, but he can't change any of the settings. He can't go and change the notebook or add new notebooks or change how it works. But he can just click go and refresh that data if he needs to. There's quite a nice ability for us to define this stuff. I have these fairly complicated maps of, independent, of, of uh, interdependent tasks and still actually bring other people into it and still allow other people to work with it. Oh, probably loads of other stuff I've not dug into. Uh, but as a quick flavor, if you have not seen a Delta Live table before, that's what it is. Do encourage you to have a look through the docs. Loads of extra stuff we can do. Loads of cluster settings. Loads of additional things we can get Delta Live tables to do. But as a core story, taking some SQL from your business users and essentially just adding some of those keywords or getting them to add the keywords and then allowing it to turn it into a an actual end-to-end -end data pipeline. It's really cool. Being able to visualize this stuff and all the logging and telemetry that you normally have to get someone to build. Really, really nice being able to see that and get those detailed actual telemetry observability stuff spat out into some events tables that we can again go and query later. <sighs> cool. So that is it. Delta Live Tables is now generally available. You can now go into any Databricks workspace, click on DLT and go and have a play. I believe it is GA in AWS and Azure. I think it's in preview. I'm not sure it's public or private in GCP. But it's really good if you are currently in Azure, certainly which is where I tend to do most of my work. You can go and have a play with DLT right now and then see how you think. Yeah, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know again down in the comments if you're having a play already with DLT, what you think of it, how it works. Does it do everything you need it to do? Is it going to replace your ETL framework? Personally, I kind of see it's it's not going to replace every single bit of ETL framework we do. A little bit black boxy in some spaces, but it's going to be really, really easy for the kind of people who are just starting out and they don't already have a load of IP. They don't have a load of code and functionality and libraries to help them process data. So to do that first stepping stone onto a, where do we even begin building out an end to end data process? Loads of stuff in here that will help people reach that goal really quickly and actually in a very good way with some great stuff around quality expectations and the logging. That's about it. As always, thank you for watching and let me know next time where you're at. Cheers.